Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Creative Mornings, Oakland. Thank you. And a huge thanks to Oakland Museum of California for hosting and collaborating with us. Our theme for the month is Moments, chosen by the chapter in Montreal, Canada. Following the theme of Moments, we really wanted to recognize a significant moment in Oakland's history, and that is the rise of the Black Panther Party. So with that, we're inviting Oakland artist Sadie Barnett who's been featured in galleries around the country and around the world, and her father, Rodney Barnett, who founded the Compton chapter of the Black Panthers. So with that, please welcome Sadie and Rodney Barnett. Um, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us at the Oakland Museum. Very early, hella early in the morning. I'm Sadie, this is my dad, Rodney. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank uh, Creative Mornings for having us and also thank the Oakland Museum for having us here this morning and also for inviting me to participate in this exhibition. It's been such an amazing experience um, to be included in the exhibition, All Power to the People, Black Panthers at 50, and to share my dad's story. Um, when I first started working on this project, which uses as source material 500 pages of FBI surveillance that was kept on my father during his time as a young activist, um, I was very particular about where I wanted to show the work because it's very personal. It's our family history as well as being political. And I knew that it would be in great hands with the Oakland Museum um, as one of the main aims of the curator of the show, Renee de Guzman, was to really show um, a more in-depth and accurate history of the Black Panthers. So um, I knew that the piece would really be contextualized. You know, a lot of people just think of the Black Panthers as uh, the leather jackets and the guns and don't really know that really the main aim of the organization was um, community activism, community service, and a really uh, systemic and intersectional analysis of oppression. So I'm not gonna go into as wonderful of a history of the Black Panthers as you can see in the exhibition. So I really encourage you to stay uh, after the talk and see it. You know, I'm not gonna do a major history about the Black Panthers, but I did want to have this image up, which is the 10 point program and really just in their own words, let the, uh, the mission of the Panthers speak, speak for itself. And hopefully um, we can talk more about it in the exhibition. So in the next uh, 20 minutes, we're gonna illustrate some key findings that we found in my dad's FBI file. Um, and I'll also discuss how I turn them into works of art. Um, and after that, we're happy to answer any questions and hear from you guys. Um, so that, as I sort of start taking people through some of these images, this first one is from uh, works in progress in my art studio. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how and why you requested your FBI files. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. As um, Sadie said, I was uh, active in the Black Panther Party in the LA area in 68 and 69, as were many thousands of other people. While I was active in the party, there were uh, some strange things that happened. And uh, after I was no longer a member of the Black Panther Party, I found out more about COINTELPRO and J. Edgar Hoover's program to destroy civil rights organizations, including the Black Panther Party. And for years, I was curious about who I encountered in the party that may have been an informant or FBI agent or some other um, you know, kinds of informant, because some strange things happened that actually uh, caused me to leave the, the Panther Party. So um, <clears throat> with Sadie's help and uh, with Sadie's mother, Ellen, we decided to tackle the issue of getting my FBI files, which I didn't know they had any of them. <laughs> <laughs> but, <clears throat> so 
So uh, the, the law had changed a couple of times about your right to request uh, freedom of information uh, files on yourself, and it became more difficult. So at some point, we decided, well, we're going to just do this. We sat down, and you know, to make a long story shorter, um, it took us five, three years to get the f four years, years. To, before we could get the files. I also worked uh, with Angela Davis when she was on trial, and so the part of the files uh, reflected some of the activities I was involved with with the Free Angela Davis uh, Committee too. And one of the related stories was I asked for that information, and they told us, well, you have to get her permission to, to get anything about you and her. I said, well, that was strange. You tried to kill her, and then now you're protecting her, <laughs> <clears throat> protecting her privacy. So, <laughs> so I contacted Angela, and she had to fill out a form to, for, in order for me to get that part of my uh, FBI files. We so got, in the, uh -huh. this image, this is from an exhibition I have up right now in New York. The exhibition's called Do Not Destroy. And for this image, I scanned these two, you know, four-inch, 50-year-old Polaroids, uh, scanned them at like 600 DPI and enlarged them to almost life size to create this diptych portrait of my father. So you can see on the left, he's in his army uniform. He was drafted to Vietnam. And in the right, he's in what we think of as the Black Panther uniform. So Dad, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about this before and after. OK. Um, like Sadie said, that's my army uniform. Uh, and I'm not sure whether that was before I went to Vietnam or after I came from Vietnam. But uh, keep in mind, this was 1965. I was drafted into the army. I didn't volunteer to go. And at that particular time, I was stationed at Fort Polk, Louisiana. And me and a couple of other African-American soldiers decided we were going to go into town and get service at these all-white restaurants. We were refused service. We actually were arrested. So I'm telling you that so you can keep in mind the atmosphere, the restrictions that black people had uh, throughout the country on uh, our rights in the first place. So uh, I went to, through training, uh, infantry training, and then I spent 13 months uh, in Vietnam. I, I got a purple heart. I was wounded in Vietnam. Uh, I had, it was a hand grenade booby trap, I think, and that same booby trap killed one of my best friends who actually died in my arms. It was a horrible, bloody uh, war. And when I went to Vietnam, the, Vietnam was such a rich, green vegetation place. And when I left there, when they flew me out on a plane, Agent Orange it destroyed so much of the land. It just looked like a dead place. At any rate, I came back uh, to Los Angeles. My sister's oldest son just got killed in Vietnam, and I came to L.A. Uh, to go to his funeral. Uh, originally, I'm from Boston, Massachusetts. So um, while I came to my nephew's funeral, the, the police in L.A. were out of control, and they were doing things that we were ordered to do in Vietnam. They were conducting warlike uh, things against the black community. Somebody allegedly was black that robbed a bank, and they would line up and go through people's homes and yards and everything looking for bank robbers. And then they shot down and killed uh, different members of the community. So it was really bad, and I felt that, you know, I served my country, and I didn't come back to have to go through this, so I felt compelled that I needed to do something, and the Panthers were very active in the Los Angeles area, so I decided that that's what I should do, and that's how I got that uh, black leather jacket and free Huey Newton buttons and beret. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so in the gallery directly across from these you know, photographic portraits. On this other wall hangs uh, over 100 pages of the FBI file. Here's a better view. So I wanted to juxtapose this very two-dimensional, bureaucratic, um, invasive text version of the FBI's version of your life uh, with these pol Polaroid portraits. And I've added these splashes of pink and black spray paint really as a way to reclaim these files and 
bring this into our story, um, as well as the pink referencing this like daughter looking at her father. Um, some people also think the spray paint reminds them of blood or bullet holes or also graffiti, so it's almost like tagging on these files and re reclaiming them. Here's another detail. Um, so one thing we recognized immediately when going through these pages was how intense the surveillance was. Uh, there was informants at the Panther meetings. There were agents observing my dad. Um, they interviewed every employer you've ever had, your high school teacher, the little old lady next door to where you grew up um, as a child. So there's just so many individual moments that are distilled in these pages uh, in a really chilling account. So this uh, page, Hopefully you guys can read the text. Um, but it's June 15th, 1973. Sure. Rodney Barnett was observed uh, boarding an airplane with Angela Davis. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, um, you know, we, the Free Angela Davis campaign was a very successful campaign that she got support from all over the world. It was really an amazing campaign. I was glad to be a, a part of that. But after Angela was uh, not convicted uh, and, you know, the trial was over and they were still following her and following me. You know, I'm a citizen, she's a citizen. We never did anything wrong, broke any laws, but yet they're still following us everywhere we go. So this is an incident where after Angela um, was set free, she was going home to visit her family in Alabama, and I, I went with her. And that turned up in the file. I didn't know they were watching us that closely. But. Um, so in this image, you can see again the like, pink spray paint dripping down. And this is how the informants were listed and redacted. Um, so how many informants were? Well, uh, keep in mind, this is just the LA area. And uh, we found at least eight informants that reported you know, to their superiors in the FBI about activities that I was engaged in and that other Panthers were engaged in. And basically, the job was to make up stories that the FBI could use to uh, harass us, to kill us, or put us in jail or whatever, and that's what they did. In fact, later on, after they made these initial reports and continued to make reports about things, I mean, one of the things was that Rodney Barnett was seen meeting with a group of ministers in Los Angeles and talking about establishing free breakfast programs for the children. And, and that's, and, and, and Jay Edgar Hoover thought that that was one of the worst uh, things that the Panthers could do that made the Panthers so dangerous. Anyhow, um, some of the um, informants, uh, a couple of years later, uh, the FBI went back to them because they wanted them to uh, testify uh, against me and other Panthers. And, and to their credit, some of them said, we're not going to do it, um, you know. I assume that they got some kind of break from the government, and that's why they became informants. Uh, maybe they plea bargained for some crime that they committed and they <coughs> were promised uh, leniency. Uh, I don't know, and I didn't know who they were either, but that's part of why I wanted my FBI files to connect the dots of who did this, who was really strange and trying to provoke, like, agent provocateurs and stuff. Um, so this... Page is talking about uh, the security of government employees. Um, can you tell us what happened with your job at the post office? Yeah, um, when I got out of the Army, um, I, I was able to get a job as a letter carrier uh, in the post office in, in Los Angeles. And it's supposed to be a pretty secure job, um, you know. At any rate, um, <clears throat> they began to uh, follow me. I came to meetings um, in my uniform, postal, you know, mail delivery uniform after. The Black Panther meetings. Yeah, came read. to Black Panther meetings uh, in my um, postal uniform. And uh, I, I guess that set off uh, an initial attempt to get me fired. And, uh, and I found out that that's part of what COINTELPRO does, and that's what they're doing today. You've got activists who were arrested for something. They send letters to your employer. This person was demonstrating on a freeway, right? 
So at any rate, there was a long drawn out thing. They came to my job and talked to my supervisor. And they all said, well, Rodney's a good worker. You know, we like him. And, and you know, they said, well, you have to get rid of him. Uh, and they found out that I was living with a woman in Los Angeles with, her, with my son and her son. And they thought that they could use that as a uh, basis for terminating me because what they called it was conduct unbecoming of a government employee. And what happened was during the Truman presidency, President Truman issued an executive order. I can't remember the exact number. It of was the order. A 10450. 10450. So I feel like we've all been hearing about executive orders a lot recently. Um, so this was Truman's right. executive order, which was. Truman was homophobic, and he used that order to purge all gay people from federal government jobs. And that's what happened with that. So they were using that same uh, conduct unbecoming thing to try to terminate me. And they did, you know, so I got fired. I think also uh, that's something I've been thinking about recently. You know, this law was put on the books to get gay people out of government jobs. And I think nowadays people, you know, might think, oh, well, this law doesn't affect me. You know, I'm not an immigrant. This law doesn't affect me. I'm not Muslim. But the point is that these laws can be used uh, to target whoever the government decides is, you know, inconvenient or uh, speaking up at that time. This page is actually a statement that my dad says about the matter of being fired. So I just think it's uh, so eloquent and the spirit of resistance in my dad comes across in this statement. You know, he could have just said something that I won't say because, <laughs> um, but you know, instead of just telling them where to go and what to do, he makes this really eloquent statement and you can really, you know, hear uh, the passion and the resistance and the wisdom even through, you know, this cold, uh, chilling FBI r pages of repression. So I'll give you guys a second to read the, the second paragraph. Could I just add something while you're reading that? Um, <clears throat> I applied again in later years for a job at the post office as a mail handler when I was uh, going to school. And they asked me, had you ever worked for the post office before? And I said, yeah, I, I did in LA. And I was um, terminated. And they asked me why. I said, because I was um, living with a woman I wasn't married to. I said, get out of here. We don't believe that. And, <laughs> and they, they tried to do, um, you know, uh, investigate what, what happened to me. And they couldn't find any files that, that I even worked there, right? So thank God for the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> So I can prove that I work there. So. so in this page in the installation um, is speaking, one of many pages uh, talking about your military record. And I adorn this page with these like craft store uh, purple heart rhinestones in a you know sort of failing attempt to heal some of the, the trauma, both of this experience in Vietnam and of this um, surveillance um, with like this tiny gesture of, of love. So I use these purple hearts since you received a purple heart in Vietnam. Um, this section talks about this list that my dad's name was added to, which is ADEX category one, which was a emergency apprehension and detention program list. I'll give you a, a detail of this, this page also with the rhinestones. Um, can you tell us a little bit about this list? Yeah. Um of course, I didn't know about this list at the time, but um, found out that uh, J. Edgar Hoover um, had a list uh, of people who he decided uh, to, to put on this list uh, as extremists and terrorists. And people that were on the list, you could just grab them and put them in concentration camps or in prison without any charges or trials uh, you know, for the person. So um, <clears throat> what happened later on was, I think it was the Attorney General of the United States advised J. Edgar Hoover that it was unconstitutional to have a list like that. So what J. Edgar Hoover did, he changed the name of it you know, from uh, what it was then to some other name. But the point was not um, that you couldn't put people's name on the list, but you can't do people like that who are citizens of the United States who are entitled to due process. But that didn't bother J. Edgar Hoover. He kept on with uh, expanding that list 
and I'm on it to the very day. I mean, that was one thing we've learned a lot about J. Edgar Hoover doing research for this project. He was the director of the FBI for 48 years, which, you know, he was unaccountable and unchecked uh, for decades. I mean, he had, you know, his hand in the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, a couple of years in the 70s. Um, so he's been a terrifying, you know, figure in American history. Um, on this page, if you can read this text, it's listing uh, some of the LA members that my dad worked with and their positions in the, F in the Black Panther Party and listing that they're deceased. So John Huggins and Bunchy Carter, who's here as Apprentice Carter, were assassinated at UCLA um, when they were organizing on campus there. Um, so I used these rhinestone crowns to really pay tribute to those who lost their lives. Um, and I realized through reading these files, you know, learning that my dad was on this list, um, seeing all these people that had been assassinated, how lucky I am that my dad was alive and with us to tell this story today. Um, a lot of Black Panthers aren't here with us. A lot of people lost their lives, g uh, gave their lives. Um, a lot of people, you know, families were torn apart. People are still incarcerated because of their activism as political, uh, as political prisoners. So I just realized how lucky I am to, to have my dad. Uh, this page shows where the title of that exhibition, Do Not Destroy, comes from. So there's this stamp that reads, Do Not Destroy Historical Value National Archives. And by using uh, that stamp as the title, I'm really trying to subvert the FBI's language and put it into the voice of the resistance or the people. So it becomes uh, like a rallying cry um, that says, you know, both then and now, we will not be destroyed, um, despite the FBI's attempts. Um, so to close, I have two images from the exhibition here um, that some of you may recognize. This is a graphite pencil drawing I did of my father's mugshot. It's the only image that appears in the FBI files. And I also created this nine foot high pink glitter wall uh, for it to exist on. Here's a, a detail. So this is exactly how the image appeared. It has this poster-like quality where it almost looks like you know, a Che Guevara poster, um, but it's just because it's been photocopied so many times and passed to so many offices within the FBI. But I thought that, you know, by rendering it by hand in pencil, it would turn it into, instead of a, a mugshot of a quote unquote extremist, it would be um, a, a portrait of a freedom fighter, um, which is how I beat my dad. Did you want to? Did you want to add anything? Yeah, I, uh, the thing is that I didn't know where they got that um, picture from. You know, it was in my file, and and actually too, we have pages with actual J. Edgar Hoover's signature on them, uh, demanding that uh, the agents do certain things. But um, one time, I had company at my house, and there was a soft knock on the door, and I opened the door. It was. Police uh, without uniforms, I think, I assume it was the FBI, just came in, took everybody that was in my house, handcuffed them, put them in different rooms, went through all my paperwork and stuff, and took me, uh, roughed me up and took me to jail. And then uh, my brother was able, you know, to get me out of jail. And I think that's where they got that mug shot from. So um, I want to you know, thank you guys for your attention. Obviously, there's so many stories and different moments that we could pull out, but we just wanted to share a few things with you and also leave time for question and answer. Um.